All right, welcome back to operating system. So your midterm grading's almost done. Hard to schedule like 13 TAs to grade it. So two of them got delayed, so they're grading it as we speak. So it should be back to you tomorrow. All righty, so today it's a fun lecture. Uh, it's inode, so we get to finally figure out what the hell LS does. So where we left off last time, we were talking about how to actually store the file on the disk and how you describe where the blocks of the file are. And we ended up with indexed allocation, which is basically a big array. So index zero is where points to where block zero is, index one points to where block one is of the file, so on and so forth. But we discovered that it can only hold a maximum file size of 16 megabytes, which is no good. So an inode is a compromise, and this is how files are actually described on your file system. So it contains everything about the file, so the mode, so those are the permissions, who owns it, so like the user ID that owns it and the group ID that owns this particular file. Timestamps are stored directly on this inode, and that's like when you created it, when you modified it, when you last accessed it, how many blocks it takes up, and then where it describes the actual contents or the data of the file is through a bunch of pointers that point to blocks. So there are several pointers on the inode structure itself that point directly to blocks. In the case for Linux, there are 12 direct blocks. So there are 12 spaces there that point directly to an inode. So you don't, in the case that the file takes up 12 blocks or less, we don't have to allocate a block just for pointers. So if the file is bigger than 12 blocks in this case, we have, to, we have an entry that points to a single indirect block. So that will point to a block that is full of pointers. And each of those pointers points to an actual block that represents the data. So this is where we left off last time with our 16 megabytes. That could be done through single indirect. Now, if the file is bigger than 16 megabytes, then it would go through double indirect. So it points to a block that is full of pointers, and each of those pointers points to another block that is full of pointers, and then those point to the data. So that's like having two levels of page tables. And then in the case that the file is really big, then it would be triple indirect. So points to like an L2, points to an L1, points to an L0, and then those points to blocks. So any questions about this? So it will fill them up in order because the more indirection you have, the slower it is to access because you know, I have to read a block to be able to read the pointers. So if my file only consumes 12 blocks and I use the direct blocks, and then as soon as it consumes a 12th or a 13th block, then I have to allocate you know, a single indirect uh, entry, I have to make a whole entry through full of pointers, I have to create one and then point it to the block, and that would be slower, but if it's bigger than 13 blocks, that what, that's what I have to do. So any questions based off that? So direct, fast, so the idea here is if the file's small, I want to be really quick. If it's big, well, I want to also support larger files. So the inode, again, just holds some meta metadata and pointers to blocks. Smaller files only use direct pointers, so they can access it faster. And larger files, while well, they have additional index node, which are just blocks full of pointers, and the number of blocks you have to go through that are full of pointers depends on if it's single indirect, double indirect, or triple indirect. And there is also an optimization you will encounter in lab six, so if it's a very, very, very small file, remember we argued that, hey, the blocks are probably like four kilobytes or eight kilobytes. If it only consumes like 12 bytes or something like that, instead of allocating a whole block, well, there's an optimization to actually store the contents of the file on the inode itself. So now we can have this scenario. So assume that the inode stores 12 indirect there's 12 direct pointers, one single indirect, one double, and one triple. If the block size is eight kilobytes and a pointer is four bytes, well, we should be able to argue about what is the maximum size of the file that's managed by this 
inode or index block. So in that case, the number of pointers we can fit on a single indirect table, same calculation we use for page tables. So it is the size of the block, which in this case is 2 to the 13, divided by the size of the pointer, which is 2 to the 2. So that gives us 2 to the 11. So the number of total blocks we can address with this inode, well, we can address 12 through the direct pointers, and then 2 to the 11 with the single indirect block. So that's a block full of pointers that points to other blocks. And then through the double indirect, it is 2 to the 11 to the power of 2, all that to the power of 2, because we have two levels we go through. And then for the triple indirect, it's 2 to the 11, all to the power of 3, because we're going through three levels of indirection there. So technically, I would have to add all these together, but the 2 to the 11, all to the power of 3, that will dominate. So if I want to approximate it, I can just approximate it as 2 to the 33. So the maximum size of the file now would be, well, I can point to 2 to the 33 blocks, slightly more actually. And then if I multiply that by the size of the block, I get the maximum size of the file for this case. So in this case, the maximum size of the file I can support is 64 terabytes, which is pretty big. So we're all more happy with that. That's a more reasonable file system. So this is our current inode. So your maximum file size is likely something like 64 terabytes. Past that, we have to change this structure. But for now, this should keep us good for you know, another five years or something like that. Yeah, question? Uh, models get pretty big, but yeah, 64 terabytes for a file should, should be enough for quite a while probably more than five years. So this has been around for, I don't know how long, very long time. So now we have to discuss what in the hell LS does and what a directory actually is. So each of the file names you've ever used ever, well, the file names are basically just for you. The names just help you refer to inodes, and an inode is whatever the operating system actually cares about. So if I have a file called todo.txt, that name is just going to point to an inode, and that inode describes the contents of the file, who owns it, when it was last modified, and all those things. So taking a name and pointing it directly to an inode, that it is called a hard link. And why is it called a hard link? Because as we'll discover, there's something called a soft link. So now we can actually try to describe what happens with LS. And most of this lecture will be just playing around with LS and making sure we understand it because we probably don't right now. So I will create a file called todo.txt. Let, let's make the contents just hello. So we've all used LS before, I hope. So, does every, anyone know what all those things in LS mean? Can you describe everything in that line? Yeah. Yeah, so this are, is the permissions for the file. So in this case, do you know which order they're in and what they all represent? So who, who, can, read, who can write to this file? Anyone help? Yeah. Yeah, whoever created it, which in this case should be John. So for this, these are the permissions for the owner of the file. So whoever created it. And here, this is the owner of the file. And this is the group owner of the file. And these permissions are the permissions if you are in the same group and not that user. And these are the permissions you have if you are not that user and not part of that group. So these are like the default permissions you have. All right, so this is my username, yes. So this would be the user that owns the file, and this is the group that owns the file. Anyone know what this number means? Hmm? 
All right, let's make a hint. So let's edit this file. So it was seven before. Now it's, that number went from seven to 13. So what is it likely? Yeah, number of characters or more operating system. Operating system just cares about bytes, so it's the size of the file in bytes. All right, what about this? This. Yeah, last time I, last time this file was modified. Uh, why does it show that? I don't know. And then the file name. So there's one mystery number. What the hell is that? Anyone know what this number means? It, init? Nope. Any ideas? Hmm. If you knew what this number means, you didn't need this course. This number is the whole reason this course exists. Not really, but uh, kind of. So, to create a hard link, you can create a hard link. So remember, a hard link is just a name to an inode. And in fact, we can make we can use a new column in ls. So if I use dash i, it creates a new column. This new column is some gigantic number. What is this gigantic number? Well, that gigantic number is actually the inode number that it refers to. So this means that the contents of todo.txt is on inode gigantic number. I'm not going to say it. So in order to create a hard link, I can use the ln command. And then the first argument is a name that points to an inode. So this is, I want to create another name that points to the same inode as this todo.txt. And I can call it b.txt. So if I do that and ls and show the inode number again, I can see that the inode numbers are the exact same. Oh, something interesting happened with that number. What's likely that number? Cl close, yeah. Yeah, the number of hard links to that inode. So we finally found out what the hell that last number means. So if I create another one, so let's say I create another hard link called d.txt, I can see, oh, that number has increased again to three. And now all of these names refer to the same inode, and that describes the contents of the file. So anyone want to tell me what happens if I just edit, let's say, b.txt? I say, hello, everyone. Now if I look at the contents of todo.txt, what am I likely going to see? Yeah, hello, everyone. Because, well, the inode describes every, all the contents of the file. So now, since they are all hard linked to that same inode, well, if I open that file, it will open that inode. That inode actually describes where all that data is. So if I modify that inode through any of the names, it modifies that inode. And the contents change through all of them. All right, any other questions for that? Kind of fun, right? Not really, ish. So what's the point? Why not create two what, sorry? So if I want them to be this, like, uh, just yeah, co copy a file or something like that? Yeah. Isn't that kind of bad? Could be bad, could, could be not. Let's see, we can use dash A and C. That way we know what that number means. Well, directories aren't bad, but we see here the number of links to dot is two. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what does dot, dot mean? Uh, it's this directory. Yeah, this directory. 
the contents of this directory need to be stored somewhere. They're stored in an inode. In this case, whatever, ends in 60. So dot points to this inode 60. And since there are two links to it, what is probably another link to it? The absolute path or more specifically, whatever it's called above it. So in here, if I just back up a directory, well, I have to be able to get to this directory. So in this directory, inode 60 is called test directory. So that's its two entries. One entry is test directory, and then another entry that points to that same inode is dot in that directory itself. So that's fun. Then why is dot dot have three entries? Yeah, so for this, dot dot, there's three things pointing to it. So I'm pointing through it through dot dot. If I go up to dot dot, well, what's it end in? 56. So inside of the directory itself, it has a dot, which is also 56. And then if I back up again, it's called whatever it's called. Oh, God. Uh, it's called inodes. So this is three, and then in here it's called dot, and then in this directory it's called dot dot. So, so the third hot link is created, will it create a subfolder in the directory? Yep, so let's see. If I do make dir, say directory one, and then do it again, oh, the number of references to dot just went up by one, because in directory one, there's a hard link to it called dot dot. Cool, huh? All right, any questions about that? So how do they keep track of it? So you will discover how they keep track of it through lab six a bit, but really your whole file system hierarchy is a, a tree, right? It's a in fact, it's a DAG if we remember algorithms and stuff. It's a directed acyclic graph. And the only thing you need to know is the root. And the root has a very specific inode. The root directory is always called inode2. And that's how everything starts. To see that I am not full of it, I can do ls of the root directory. Inside of the root directory, it will have an entry called dot. And it is inode2. So I was right with the magic number. And the root directory is the only one that's special where it gets to loop on itself, in which case it has an entry for dot dot. But because it's the parent of everything, it's also the parent of itself. So it just has a self loop at the top. But knowing this, so everything is reachable through the root directory. So you just start at inode 2, and then you can just go through everything. So just operating systems is really just magic numbers all over the place. So what else can we do? Oh, yeah, we might notice uh, other fun things. So if I do rm of a file, does that actually delete anything? Yeah, it just removes the name. So if I rm it, it doesn't delete a, a thing. All it does is, well, the number of references went down from three to two, because I deleted one of the hard links, but it doesn't actually remove anything. The name is actually a bit silly. In fact, if we, if I want to figure out what system call rm actually does, what, would, what command would I use to do that? S trace, everyone's friend, all right. So if I S trace, let's say I S trace removing b.txt, I can see that, oh, there's no remove system call. It's actually just called unlink. So remove does not exist. There's only a system call called unlink. And all unlink does is remove that name from the directory, and that's all it does. So what's the condition that I could actually delete the contents of that file from the hard drive and free up some space? Yeah, there's no more links to it. So 
This is also how your recycling bin works and why it should be instant. So as long as there is one hard link pointing to an inode, it's not free. So whenever you delete a file, how your recycling bin works is it just keeps a reference to that inode around and it'll keep that reference around for 30 days or whatever, but keeps it active so you don't, the hardware doesn't actually delete that file. And then eventually if you want to restore it, well, all you do is recreate a name, which is really quick and point it back to that inode and you've recovered your file. That's basically how your recycling bin works. If it's, so it's also why it's like that, even if you undelete a file that's like 20, Ooh, 20 gigabytes or something like that, it'll be instant because all we're doing is pointing to that inode again. We're not actually copying the file or doing anything random like that. But fun fact of the day, any questions about that? Or how anything else would work? Hmm. All right, what about, what's going to happen if I copy to do.txt to, I don't know, d.txt. Yeah, so in this case, to properly copy the file, like, kind of behaves like fork. So they should be exact copies of each other at the time I did the cp command, but they should be independent past that point. So if I do this, I should see that they are different inodes, so they are pointing to different blocks on the storage device itself, and in fact, they are different inodes. And now if I edit one file, they just have the same contents whenever I called CP, but after that I can modify one and not modify the other. So copying would just create a new inode and make the contents match. All right, any other fun questions? All right, well, let's look at the other part of it. So here, so remember deleting a file, RM, not a thing, can't delete a file. So you just have the unlinked system call, which just removes the hard link. And if there are zero references to the inode, then your operating system can go ahead and actually physically delete the file from the hard drive but guess what? Deleting files is also slow. So likely what your, hard what your operating system will do is if you have no links to it anymore, that I know doesn't exist, and you would, instead of clearing it up and like zeroing it or something, which would be slow, all you do is mark it as inactive. And this is also why you can sometimes recover your deleted files because while well, all they're marked, they're just marked as inactive, so if you know what an inode looks like, then you can just kind of brute force go through, all of the, go through all the inactive ones and see if it still points to valid data because likely it's still there if you've only like just tried to recover it and it, the operating system hasn't reused that block, likely you can actually recover it and that's why you pay data recovery specialists a bunch of money. They just know what they look like and know how to search through all the inactive ones to see if there's any valid data still part of it. All right, so now we can talk about soft links. So soft links, I might also call them sim links. Soft links mean the same thing. The concept of shortcuts and windows also mean the same thing. So what a soft link is, is instead of pointing to an inode, it's just a name to a name. You can think of it that way. There's another step in the middle, but conceptually a soft link is just a name to another name. So the soft link target doesn't need to exist. Soft link targets can be deleted, you know, without the notice of the soft link, you just get a weird error. And if you can, can't resolve the soft link, it leads to an exception. So why do we have soft links? So let's try and create a soft link. Do, 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 uh, here. So I can create a soft link. All I have to do is do dash s. That means create a soft link or a sim link instead of a hard link. And I'll also point it to todo.txt and I'll call it b.txt. 
Now if I ls here, I can see I created b.txt and it points to todo.txt. There's, it's a little bit more roundabout because it does need an inode and the contents that inode stores is just the name here, which is todo.txt, which is why the size is eight bytes. So now what a soft link allows us to do is, well, we can create cycles. It doesn't have to be follow that directed to a cyclic graph. And sometimes they're really useful. So like web servers use this, Python, like your Python executable sometimes is just a sim link. And in order to move to the next version of Python, all it does is update the sim link to point to the new program and that's it. And typically you just access it through a sim link. So now if I try to, you know, cat b.txt, I get hello everyone, which is the same contents of todo.txt. So what it will do if I cat b.txt, well, it knows this is a sim link. So in order to find the inode that has the contents of the file, it knows that it needs to first look at todo.txt because it's a soft link to find the inode and then it would find this inode. So same way I can kind of modify that same file. So any questions or want me to do anything silly with these sim links or soft links or whatever you want to call them? Yeah, so if I open b.txt, I just get the contents of todo.txt. Yeah. So the contents are through that inode, but it's called b.txt because that's how it, that's the name we refer to it as. But really, when, when we're modifying files, we're modifying what's stored on that file through, and that is stored in the inode. All right, want me to do anything fun? Any ideas with how we can break this? Hmm. Do I still have? Yeah. Yeah, remove the hard link or, yeah. So if I remove it, looks angry immediately. So if I do this, looks a bit weird. So I can cat it. it gives me a weird error, which doesn't make sense. It says b.txt no such file directory which is a bit weird because, well, b.txt clearly exists. What doesn't exist is what it points to. This gives you weird errors. So yeah, you would get an error because it can't actually find an inode that has the contents of the file or anything like that. All right, anything, anything else I can do fun with sim links? So are cycles bad? Or infinite loops, everyone loves infinite loops. So I could probably create one more soft link that would create an infinite loop, right? What, what should I create? Yeah, let's create a soft link that points to b.txt and call it to do.txt. So in this case, looks kind of bad. So to find the contents of b.txt, it's to do.txt. To do.txt, it's b.txt. What happens if I do this? It will know. An error? An error just hangs forever. How smart are kernel developers? Ah, too many levels of symbolic links. Hmm. All right, well, then the question is, who's smart? The kernel developers or whoever wrote cat? Kernel, cat, how would I figure out who's smart? S trace, yeah, I can S trace it. So. If cat's smart, well, it would open b.txt, then I'd see it open to do.txt. Maybe I see it go a few times and then give up. 
If the kernel's smart, I probably will only see an open of b.txt. So, goes through a bunch of crap, and let's see. Open this. So we can see, we just tried to open b.txt and that was it, and then we got an error immediately from the kernel. So the kernel is smart. All right, any other questions about fun sim links? Too many levels, so it went through, like, the cycle was too big. So it has, like, a hard limit for a cycle, so it will only go through, like, 10 sim links or something like that. You have more than two. That's how it gets yeah, you can have a cycle of more than two, you can have three. There's going to be some limit in the kernel where if you go through sim links after X number of steps, it's just going to give up and give you an error message. All right. So, also, fun security tip. If you allow users to upload any type of file to your server, well, one big vulnerability you could do is upload a sim link. So you could upload a sim link and point it to root, and then suddenly you can access any file on the server, which is fun. And that's why, guess what? Web servers generally do not follow symbolic links because it allows you to do silly things like that. So that is your security tip of the day. All right, what other fun things can we do? Oh, other fun things we can do. We can use this stat command, and stat will tell us all the information on the inode, except, well, the file name is not stored on the inode, but it will tell us a whole bunch of fun stuff. So this is the size of the file in bytes. This is how many blocks it takes up on your device. In this case, it seems really, frankly, stupid because it takes up eight blocks and it's only 16 bytes. So why would it take up eight blocks and only be 16 bytes? Well, the blocks reported here is stupid. <laughs> so the blocks reported here, for some reason, don't ask me why, that is the number of 512 byte blocks, and it is just hard coded at that number for reasons I don't know. So, the IO block here is the size of the block on your actual device. And in this case, if you just take 4096 and divide by the hard coded 512, you get 8. So, this is actually pointing to one IO block, one block on the hard drive itself. So all your files will be, at least for this, it will be in multiples of blocks of eight because it's a dumb fixed size and don't ask me why. You will encounter that in lab six. So just remember that this stupid blocks is hard-coded 512 bytes. All right, so it has some other things. So device is just the magic number that tells you what actual physical SSD this is on, and then the inode number, number of links, permissions, and then there's a whole bunch of timestamps. So access, modify, change, and birth. Modify and change sound like the exact same thing, but modify is the last time you modified the contents of the file, and change is the last time you modified the inode itself. So like you change the permissions or something that didn't actually touch the contents of the file. And guess what? All these timestamps you can change at will. And this is why timestamps on your device don't matter because if I wanted to, I could change all these to 1968 or whatever year I wanted to. And no, that is not the year I was born. Do not be smart asses. All right, any other questions about that stuff or other fun stuff I could do? So yeah. Where are all oh. the information in the inode actually stored? So where is the inode actually stored? So you will fi you will it'll be part of your lab 6, but the inodes are stored on blocks, so there'll be some blocks in your device set aside that just stores a whole bunch of inodes, so they're stored directly on the device. Yeah? I was just going to say, if you have like a free trial of the software, can you just like keep on modifying it? Like let's say you have it free for like 30 days, can you keep on modifying this inode like time and 
Yeah, if you have a free trial of something that has like a timestamp, it depends how they check when you've last accessed it. If they check it through file timestamps, yeah, just set it back in time. Some games do that too. They care about your system clock, so you just change the time back a bit and they think it's whatever time you set it. Generally, it's not that smart. And you know, if you're taking an English course or something like that, they don't know you can just freely modify these things. So you can just modify it yourself and say, hey, I submitted this you know, 10 weeks ago, no problem. Also, I, I definitely never, ever, ever did that. So if you want to, no, wait, should I tell you how to do it? Okay, yeah, so, oh, that's freaking out, cool. All right, so, in order to modify it, uh, whatever, I'm too deep now. All right, so this is, whoops, d.txt, let's see, everything, I last modified it at 31 or whatever, so if I modify it now, and I stat it, I should see that, okay, now I've changed the inode, I've changed, I've modified it, and I've accessed it beforehand. So if I want to update all these timestamps without actually doing anything to the file, I can, that's what the command touch is for. So if I touch it, all it does is reset all of the timestamps to the current time. So now I've reset all these to whenever I ran touch. So access, modify, and change. And guess what? If you look at the man pages of this, well, it lets you update and access modification times of each file. Oh, guess what? I can change the modification time. I can change the whatever. And it just takes the date of this format. Change it to whatever the hell you want. So, so now you can tell after taking this course, it makes life harder for you because you guys can't fool me. You could just use that. Oh yeah, no problem, I submitted it a month ago. What the hell are you talking about? Oh, that was before it was even released. Oh, okay, makes sense. So, I definitely didn't show you that command and you forgot all of that. So, any questions not regarding that? So that's fun. You can also, can this thing stop freaking out? Uh, you can also, you know, use it to mess with your friends if you really want, prove to them that, you know, you created some sick software before you were even born and they have no idea, so you can play a lot of tricks with first years. All right, so real quick too, for this example, so touch, if you just give it a new file name and that file doesn't exist, it will create an empty file for you with that name. So in this case, if I do touch, that will create a new inode and the contents of the inode is nothing. So it will just be an empty file. If I do ln, that should make a new name b.txt point to the same inode as to do.txt. And then if I create a soft link called c.txt, that should point to the name to do.txt. So, before the move command, my file system should look like this. So C is a soft link, so it points to todo.txt, and todo.txt and b.txt are both hard links pointing to inode one. So any questions about how we got to that point? So now, if I do a move, move is a weird name because it doesn't actually move anything. All it does is rename the file. So technically, it should, yeah, it should probably just be called rename because move to do.txt to b.txt, all that does is change the name of to do.txt to b.txt. So after the move, well, we don't have to do.txt, it's just called d.txt now, and c.txt, that soft link, now points to the name to do.txt which I'll put in a filled in box because it doesn't exist anymore. And now if I do rm b.txt, that doesn't actually remove anything, it just gets rid of the name b.txt. Now it point, points just to an inode. So any questions about how we arrived at this? All right, so 
In Unix, everything's a file. So even directories are types of files. So the only thing special about a directory is, well, we can go back and see what's special. Whoops. So if I start dot, the only thing special about directory is here it tells you what the type of the inode is. For a directory, it's just type is a directory. But other than that, it's not that special. It takes up blocks, so it consumes some storage on the device. And the contents of a directory, all they are is name, inode, tuples, and that's it. So the contents of this directory would just be a bunch of tuples. So there'd be dot pointing to this inode, an entry for dot dot pointing with this inode, an entry for B with this inode, an entry for D1 with this inode, so on and so forth. So all the directory is is just a specially formatted contents that are just name inode tuples. And you can think of it as just a list of name inode tuples that represents everything in the directory. That's it. So any questions about that? Directories, turns out there's not that much special about them. So on Unix, everything is a file, so like some so pipes, you can create name pipes if you want that are represented through an inode. So that's a way to share them between processes. Sockets can be represented as an inode um, and all sorts of fun things. In fact, if you like proc, C, look at proc CPU info or all your proc things from lab, was that lab one? Those don't take up any space on your hard drive, but they consume inodes, and you can actually you know, use them as if they were files. But the only magic that happens with those is those inodes, well, the kernel controls. So if you try to cat it, and you try to access you know, CPU info or anything in the proc directory, the kernel will essentially intercept all of your accesses to that inode, and it will just make up data for it because it just needs to make up some bytes so you can read and write bytes to it. So if you just proc, you know, proc one command or status or whatever, the kernel knows that you're trying to access that data and it would just provide that data through that inode. All right, any questions about that? So if you stat all those inodes, you'll see that they consume zero bytes on the drive and the kernel just handles them specially. So you're not allowed, so if I hard link a directory to a different name, so yeah, you can try that, but um, you are not allowed because that would break the, the hard links are always a directed acyclic graph. So if I try to do something, what you want me to do, like if I create a hard link to dot and call it that, not allowed to create hard links for directories. Yeah, you're just not allowed to create a hard link for a directory ever. Because oh. otherwise you could create cycles and you break things. So yeah, you're not allowed to create hard links to directories. The kernel will forbid you from doing that. Otherwise you could do odd things. So all the dot, dot, and dot, 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 all, dot, and dot, dot, those hard links are all managed by the kernel itself. You're not allowed to touch them. And that's why there are separate system calls specifically for directories sometimes. All right, so now we can say, well, what's stored on an inode? So we'll go through this in record time. So what's stored on the inode? The file name not stored on the inode. Names are only stored in directories. The inode also doesn't know what containing direct, what directories it's in. The file can also be in multiple directories. The file size is stored on the inode. The type is stored on the inode. So if it's a directory, if it's a regular file or 
a socket or whatever or a sim link. The number of soft links, not stored on the inode. Location of soft links, not stored on the inode. The only thing that's stored is the number of hard links to that inode. So this is stored on the inode because while well, the kernel has to keep track of this number because if the number of references goes to zero, then it means this file's not used anymore. It can mark it as inactive or less likely delete it. And the location of the hard links aren't known for the inode itself. If you need to ask, you know, what are all the names that point to this inode, you would have to traverse everything starting from root because you have no idea. Uh, the access rights or permissions are stored directly on the inode. Same with the timestamps that we now kind of know how to modify. And the file contents are sometimes stored in the inode itself. So you will find this optimization for sim links that are very, very small. So instead of pointing to a block, so if you're only storing like eight bytes of data, there's no point consuming an entire four kilobyte block when there's some extra room on the inode itself, you can just store it on the inode. And then the order list of data blocks, well, that is what an inode is basically there for. It's to tell you where the contents of this file actually exist on the disk. So any questions about that? All right. So other fun things. So. Writing data to a disk is slow, so generally what happens if you are modifying a file? Well, the operating system is going to have to read that block of data into memory, and if you modify it, well, it's slow to just write it directly out to the drive. Typically what will happen is it will just cache your writes in memory and they won't actually go to the disk because that's really slow. And also, well, if you just modified the file, likely you're editing the file, so you're gonna probably modify it again. So in that case, they have something called temporal locality. So if I modify it, it's very likely that I will modify it again. So it's probably a good idea just to cache it, keep it around in memory and not actually write it to disk. And likely, if I'm modifying a file and I modify block zero, well, I will probably modify block one at some point in the future. So maybe I want to load that into memory before you actually use it so that it's there already. That's something called prefetching. So what will happen to that is because writing to sl is really slow, there'll be a kernel thread or something like that that just, if there's some idle time, it will periodically write the changes out to disk and that is why sometimes when you are modifying a file and you pull out the power or your battery dies or something like that, all your changes get lost even though you would assume that, hey, I modified a file, it should be on my disk and it's not because it was cached in memory, you pull out the power and it wasn't actually written back out to disk so you would lose some information. And spoiler alert, this is also why you know that uh, if people are using Windows or I guess Mac, you know when you put in a USB drive and it's like safely remove? Safely remove means flush the write cache. So for instance, you might know sometimes if you put in a USB drive, this has happened to me, and you copy a gigantic file to it, and you know that that USB drive is slow, sometimes it, the operating system will be like, yep, I'm done, I have copied the contents of the file, but if you were to yank it out, well, it didn't actually finish writing all the contents back out to the USB drive. So if you hit safely remove from hardware, you will sit there for like minutes while it's actually physically writing out the data back to the drive. And as soon as it tells you it's safe to remove it, it means it's written everything back out to the drive so it's actually stored on the device. So, yep. So uh, that's what happens on Windows and Mac, what does Alma and Was what? So uh, unmount, so you'll get kind of familiar with them, but unmount basically takes a device and maps it to a directory so you can access it. And what was the other one? Unmount and eject. Eject is like the same thing as unmount. So 
yeah, in order to make devices available, sometimes you have to just give them a directory name so you can access them through that directory name. But so there are system calls to actually go ahead and trigger a write to. So this is basically what that safely remove drives. So there's a flush and there is a sync system call. And that basically just forces all of the write caches to happen. And now we are out of time. So just remember, pulling for you. We're on this together.